This is API Conversations, number one, with Martin Willis, recorded on the 19th of October, 2015. Hi, this is Paul Carr, and with me is the podcast UFO principal, Martin Willis. Hello, Martin. Hey there. How are you, Paul? Martin, uh, sort of tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started. Well, I, I consider myself, you know, maybe an armchair ufologist. I'm not really a ufologist. I just have an interest in the topic. It fascinates me. The people that are interested in the topic fascinate me. Basically, what happened is... Uh, I always was kind of open-minded to the UFO topic. Growing up, uh, there was actually a wave, a flap, or whatever, as you will, in uh, New England during the 60s. So I grew up while that was happening. Um, I had a sighting back in 2006 that I still can't explain today. Um, I don't think it was anything that possibly could have been made on Earth. And um, when people ask me what made it exceptional to me at the time was that something was moving above me. Um, it was a form that I could see clearly and that it absolutely made no sound at all. And that's what was the most baffling to me is the fact that it didn't make any sound. So um, I just that that was uh, something I tried to report and had trouble reporting. There was some sarcasm with the police department and all that. But um, I was on a podcast and talked about it. And that, that podcast kind of went viral. And I realized that it was the topic. People are interested in the topic, and uh, so that's why I was a podcaster already, and I started the show. It's been pretty popular and a lot of fun. Yeah, um, the uh, I noticed that when I was on your show, I had quite a bump in my own download, so uh, <laughs> uh -huh. it was uh, cer certainly noticeable. Um, yeah. Now, let's go back to that sighting of yours just a little bit. Uh, this was a daytime sighting? No, it was uh, it was dusk. It was about it was in uh, Monterey, uh, well Monterey area. It was in Carmel Valley. Actually, I was at a ranch, and uh, uh, people kind of tease me when I say this, but I was sitting alone in a hot tub. And no, I was not drinking, and uh, not on any substances actually. <laughs> and uh, um, but that's always the first thing. Oh yeah, in a hot tub, you were drunk or something. California like hot tub. Yeah, yeah, drugs, it, all, it yeah. all fits right. <laughs> But no, uh, you know, this thing, something caught my eye in this thing was um, a, a perfect disc. You know, the best way to put it, it's a perfect disc. And it had, and now I had never heard anyone else say this, it had sort of a bluish glow to it. Uh, like the whole object itself had like a blue, not a sheen or anything, like an overall lighting. You know, no little lights blinking or anything like that. So it was dusk and uh, the thing flew over and again, no sound at all. And it just came to a dead stop, a sudden dead stop. And then it made a perfect, like, 45-degree angle toward Monterey. So I jumped out of the hot tub. I ran into the guest house where I was staying at this ranch and uh, called the Monterey Police Department and was handled with uh, full sarcasm um, <laughs> and put on hold for about 15 minutes. And then I, I ended up just hanging up. Ah, uh, the shame. Well, I think usually police departments, uh, they have like a, a number handy, like usually for MUFON. Yes, they do. Now, I've talked to, you know, someone from MUFON that mentioned that and also um, uh, New Fork that uh, he says also that they have those numbers. But I was not giving, given any number. And the funny thing is now, you know, I look back at it, I had no idea how to report this thing. I had no idea there was any place online that you could report a UFO sighting. Just not even a clue. And I think that's, uh, I have a feeling that I'm not alone in that if someone saw something today, the average Joe walking down the street, I think that he might think the same way, although I think more people are thinking um, everything is online these days. Right. Well, I think if people, I agree. I, it, it seems that there's, uh, by and large, uh, people have never heard of any of this stuff before, so they... Uh, even though they may be very active on the Internet, they don't know where to go with the sighting. Right. Yep. It's not part of someone's life unless it shows itself. And really. not everybody wants their sighting investigated. Uh, True. That's something we've come across. 
a lot of them changed their minds after they reported it. They said, no, I don't think I really want to go there. And they... Not only that, I hear repeatedly that it's it's about 10% of all people who have a sighting that even do any type of reporting or calling. Yeah, that's that's a rough estimate. Nobody really knows. Yes. Because uh, we, we don't know who the non-reporters are, how many of them. I'll put it this way. Now, I, I saw Richard Dolan, you know, ask this question in a an audience. And I saw, you know, a few other people ask a similar question, uh, Stanton Friedman and all that. But I will say the people that are attending those conferences are probably really high in uh, sightings. Right. In other words, uh, they're, they're, it's not the average uh, collection of people there uh, because um, uh, you know a lot of hands went up when the question was asked, how many people had sightings? But out of all those people, it was about 10 percent of the people that said they were the ones that reported it. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. You think that would be a much higher percentage in that in that population? Yeah, right. But I think it's something. It goes to show, like me, it sparks someone's curiosity, and they start paying attention to it. Right now, when you started your podcast uh, on the UFO topic, um, I, I know at that point you weren't live. You are live now. Or, mm-hmm. uh, a, the uh, how did you go about sort of? Did you have much sense of direction at that point, or did you just say, well, I'm just going to start interviewing people and see what happens? Or, Well, luckily, I had been doing a couple of different podcasts. Um, one was on comedy and comedians, and that's no longer available. And then another one on my background, which is, uh, is antiques, fine art. I've been um, in that field for 40-something years since I was a little kid. And uh, so I had already been doing a lot of podcasts and knew how to go about contacting people, but I found um, my very first podcast, which is always a hard show to, to get someone on, you know, I mean, I decided I was going to do a UFO podcast, and that's why I chose kind of a silly name for it, Podcast UFO, but it sure gets a lot of hits. Anyone looking for a uh, podcast on UFOs will definitely land yeah, on my th- page. those are the first two uh, Google search words a lot of people are going to use. <laughs> yeah. So anyway... Um, <coughs> I contacted a number of people, including Stanton Friedman and, you know, a lot of people in the field. I had no idea what I was doing, basically, when it came to UFOs. I just had a curiosity and my own sighting. I started watching YouTube videos and started reading. Um, This is all in 2000, uh, toward 2011, when I finally started the show. Uh, The sighting happened in 2006. So, uh, finally, I was Stephen Bassett, you know, just Mr. Disclosure, uh, um, he mm-hmm. answered, sure, I'll be on your, sh- your first show. No problem at all. So, um, I've had him on a few times, you know, because of that, I'm grateful that he was the first one to take a chance. I don't totally agree with everything Steven says, but, uh, that's not up to me. I, I present, you know, a lot of guests and let the uh, listening audience decide, uh, for themselves about that guest. Right. I, I remember he had a meltdown once on another show. He uh, sort of had a meltdown on one of my shows. Oh, did he? Yes. Um, I think I, I, it was a question that I asked him that he just kind of went a little berserk about. Mm. And I forget exactly what it had to do with. It was something about, oh, yes, it was something about the film, the DVDs or something on uh, the uh, event, the big event he had. Oh. Uh, yeah, he does, he, does have a, he does have a few meltdowns. Well, I remember somebody uh, once asked him, uh, you know, why he, he runs a conference, right, called the Ask Conference. Somebody asked him uh, why he had some low credibility speakers at the conference, and he just. <laughs> uh, I think that was my show. Was I it? believe that I believe that was my show. Yes, could have, um, could have been. Yeah, yeah, uh, that that may have very well been what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, well, you know, my memories, I, I don't have any confidence in them. So it could, could have been your show, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, he did it twice yeah. or, more, or more. Could be, could be. <laughs> um, the, uh, now, uh, since then, you, I don't know, how many episodes have you done? It's been well over 100. I mean, yeah, it's 172, I believe, 172 at this point. Wow. And, you, and a few of them are repeat guests. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, my my favorite of your guests, even though I I don't know what to think of him, was Ray Stanford. Uh, 
Oh yes. I mean, I think I think he's a he has kind of a uh, he's a he's a talented man in some respects. Uh, he's very gifted. I mean, he finds these dinosaur fossils that nobody else there yes. else walks right past, uh, and wouldn't even notice they were dinosaur fossils. Yep. He can find them. Uh, he's found lots of them, so you know it's proven. He's he's written uh, prof- papers and professional journals about his uh, his fossil finds, and uh, he has finds in the Smithsonian, uh, right? A- mm-hmm. And he's got some kind of perceptual quirk. That- That's a really good way to put it. Um, you know, I mean, you're totally right about that. Um, his his entire I, I got to visit his house. I was down there. Actually, you probably listened to the show I did live from his house. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he's got broken up uh, rock formations with dinosaur tracks all through his house. And he's got little paths that you have to walk through to get from one room to the other. <laughs> it's very unique. You'll never see anything like it. And his most unique track he has, and I, I'm not even going to try to tell you what type of dinosaur it was, but right next to it is a hairy paw uh, probably some type of cat footprint, really unique. And uh, he's also has a couple of tracks that are um, the only known of certain uh, dinosaur species uh, at certain ages and things like that. So right in his living room, amazing. And to, just one more thing I want to add is a lot of these he found right on the uh, Beltway, down uh, right at right even at Goddard Space Station, right where he, yeah, you know, uh, well, right I, around I've, the I've been I've been to visit that spot, yeah, uh, because I used to I work on the main Goddard campus, and uh, oh, yeah, uh, he uh, he, which, which is not far from his house, which is uh, right a few miles from his house, he's um, yeah, he walked uh, people that was a uh, that used to be right now, there's a building there now. He used to, uh, it used to be a walkway, and people walked right past those fossils every day. <laughs> he, he goes onto the campus, just, I think he's just messing around, waiting for his wife to get out of work or something. And yep. He, and he says, oh, that looks like dinosaur footprints. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, how, how that is even possible, I mean, you know, people at Goddard generally are not paleontologists or trained in fossil hunting, but still, I mean, that... Uh, that you know, he he perceives things in a way that's different from from everybody else. I agree, and the thing of it is, he has had numerous UFO sightings, and he actually has uh, the thing that is really really strange about this. Really gets you wondering: is he has uh, he has like a premonition he's going to have one, and he'll get. He said he just you know he, he gets like all excited, and all of a sudden you know he'll grab his camera. Next thing you know, there there's a UFO. I mean. It's hard to even believe that any of this, if he didn't have those pictures that he took, and if he didn't have his wife, Sheila, who was a witness many times, uh, right with him when he was taking these pictures, it would be really hard to believe that. Hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I've actually tried to contact him myself, but he, uh, yeah, my emails have apparently gone into his, his uh, bit bucket, but... Uh, we'll talk about that. I'll connect you. Yeah, because I, I would love to just go chat with him about that, and also about some of his thoughts on uh, on Mars. I know he has some. Uh, when I saw his little talk at Goddard, uh, it was impossible to get to him because everybody wanted to swarm around and talk about the fossils. I really couldn't get him aside, but he uh, he mentioned some fossils on Mars. That, well, <laughs> well, I should say put it this way: he mentioned that there were some images on Mars that he thought looked suspiciously like fossil traces. Mm. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, if this wasn't coming from a race Stanford, I think it was kooky. Right. <laughs> but since it's coming from a guy who can find fossils almost with his eyes closed, I, <laughs> maybe, maybe it means something. So, you know, I'd love talking about that because uh, there are, there are other scientists who think they have seen things that could have been, could be uh, fossil traces as well. So, Really? Wow, that's really It's not a mainstream view, but mm-hmm. it is a serious view. Yeah. So, um, now, uh, okay, Ray's a really cool, interesting guy. I, I'm not sure I believe everything he says, but uh, he's uh, he certainly got some credibility. Um, mm-hmm. What about some of the other guests? That, tell me about some of the other guests you've had on that you thought 
wow, this guy's really on the ball and what he's saying is important. Well, I had uh, one of the one of the guests that I often have uh, commented on in the past was I had uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bennett, who is a visiting um, senior sci- scientist at NASA for a few years. Uh, he's an astrophysicist and a real sharp guy. And just one of the phrases that he said during my show, I've, it kind of burned into my memory. And I'll, I'll try to repeat it here, not not exactly verbatim, but you know, similar to what he was saying. And that is his fellows, his colleagues, and himself while working at NASA all quietly agree that if any intelligence can get through the bottleneck of technology without blowing themselves up, they will indeed be traveling the stars. Hmm. And I just really liked that, that phrase. And I, and you know, I'm nowhere near any type of scientist or anything like that, but I can totally understand that. And, you know, I think we're at the bottleneck, (laughs) you know, and whether we get through it or not, you know, here we have, uh, you know, nuclear arms and all, all different types of ways to destroy ourselves as a species. Well, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, mean, I, I kind of felt when the Berlin Wall came down that maybe we were past the worst of it, but not past all of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. I mean, the, the first part of the 20th century was such a horror that you mm-hmm. got to figure, oh, this is a species that's out to destroy itself. But, yeah, that was the bloodiest, uh, bloodiest century of them all. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, so Jeffrey Bennett, who else um, comes to mind? Oh, there's been uh, there's been many. There's uh, one of my favorite guests is uh, coming up, um, Kevin Randall. He's uh, Doctor Kevin Randall. He was uh, one of the people investigating Roswell uh, at one time. He's not really talking much about that these days. He is a little bit. Uh, I really enjoy um, people that also that have not really been in the circuit. You know, I like to have those type of people on my shows when I can. And there was a Ralph Blumenthal. He uh, he uh, wrote an article in Vanity Fair. He has nothing to do with, you know, UFOs or anything like that, but he wrote an article on John Mack um, in mm-hmm. Vanity Fair. He was a great guest, uh, someone very, very interesting, a journalist that actually took a dare and... Uh, uh, Leslie Kane, she's been on a number of times. She's going to be on coming up this week. Um, I've had uh, Seth Shostak, um, senior astronomer from SETI, uh, on two times. One time I had a gentleman's debate on UFOs, which I actually have one coming up. I'm not sure when this show is going to air, but live coming up on Wednesday, I have uh, Dr. Michael Shermer. I'm sure you know that name. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, he will be... Um, I think we're going to have a friendly debate. We'll see how friendly it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It'll be interesting. Yeah. He's, uh, he's written quite a few books, uh, including his famous one is Why People Believe Weird Things. Right. Yep. Uh, and my question is, isn't weird sort of subjective? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think he has an answer to that question, but I, I <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll look forward to that. Um, yeah. And I, I remember your, little debate with Seth Shostak and it was, uh, you know, he's got, I, I don't even know why he even addresses the question, frankly. I mean, I, but he gets a lot of letters apparently from people who he does. Who, he gets a lot of people trying to show him UFO sightings. He gets, um, and, uh, abduction, you know, accounts and things like that. And I think he does get kind of burned out. He told me one time and I can't even believe he'll answer an email of mine, he t- he tells me that he gets about forty five hundred emails a week. Oh and my gosh! Try to figure out how someone can weed. Well, through that's all why those he hasn't answered my last one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. I also let's see. I'll just go through quickly a couple of uh, ones that are interesting. I had uh, Doctor John Alexander on um, a few weeks ago. Um, he was in the military. He was a colonel, and he actually tried to investigate: Is there any part of the military that is uh, covering up 
UFOs and couldn't get anywhere. And he went to some pretty high places. So he was, uh, he was interesting. Um, some of my most downloaded shows, uh, um, really don't make any sense, but, um, one of them was Maddie Beckerman and he's a film producer and he did, uh, a video on, uh, Black Mountain, I think it's called, uh, episode, um, incident, uh, Let's see, I've debated also Evan Bernstein from the Skeptical Society. I'm trying to remember. Um, skeptics. Uh, no, some, he's, he's, he's on the podcast called Skeptics Guide to the Universe. Yeah. I was just trying to figure what that yeah. says, what that was. Uh, you know, and then I had some people from Rendlesham Forest, which I think is a pretty solid case. There's a lot of infighting between um, all of them. Uh, Eric uh, Von Daniken has been on uh, at at one point. Um, and so there's been a number of people that I've had in the past on that have been a lot of fun and have really, uh, like I said, it's, I, I, well, I really don't think that in my lifetime that, um, there's probably going to be any answers to anything. Um, it's still a mystery and it's still really interesting to hear people's uh, ideas uh, as yours on the yeah. on the topic. You are very interesting to talk to about the subject. Yeah, I, I one thing I wanted to uh, yeah, and you've been doing this for uh, four years. Then uh, that's right. Yep. Have you noticed any trends? Any changes? Any kind of new ways of thinking in those four years? No, you know, I um, I heard someone say a long time you know, a uh, researcher saying, you know, I've been at this for, you know, 50 years and I'm still no closer at all to the answer than I was, you know, when I started. Um, you know, I do see that there is a a jump. There's more for some reason, and maybe there's an explanation for it, but I'm not really sure. And that is that more people are seeing triangular UFOs mm-hmm. than uh, than ever before. You know, and it's kind of funny. You can joke about it and say, yeah, it's the new model of UFO that's out there or something like that. But I don't really know the particular reason for it. But uh, there just seems to be a lot more uh, triangular sightings. Yeah. Now, you had David Marler on your show, didn't you? David Marler. And he's, yeah. a, he's a great – he's one of the – I should say that he's definitely one of the top people that I consider um, that I've had on the show. Yeah, we had him on API Case Files too. So, oh, you uh, did? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, that was our best downloaded show. But- I, I – I totally understand that he is uh, he is really something else, and I really agree with um, his methodology. And you know, he's just a uh, well spoken, great guy. Yeah, you know, I I, we, I had uh, Marsha Barnhart. And I had a long conversation with him. We had to split it into two parts. Uh, and the one thing that none of us could figure out about these triangular UFOs—they are so large, mm-hmm. and so anomalous in their behavior, and yet we don't have a decent video or a decent photograph of one. Hmm. And, that is a really, really good point. Did that come up in the show? Yes, it did, and he doesn't hmm. have an answer, and I don't have an answer either. <laughs> I mean, I you look at the Belgian case, mm-hmm. it's hard to say, no, they didn't actually see anything. That was just all those people, all those gendarmes were hallucinating simultaneously. Uh and yet, you know, now this was the 80s where you didn't have digital cameras. You didn't have, not everybody carried a video camera with them. And the nighttime sensitivity was poor. But, uh, no, and people, of course, didn't carry cell phones in those days or smartphones. But, um, mm. you know, I think I got my first smartphone in 93. No, my first cell phone in 93. Probably my first smartphone in 2003. Uh, so, you know, that, so there weren't there weren't uh, iPhones at that that day, but we're still getting a lot of triangle reports. Yes. And, and now, if you remember, Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, Mark yeah. did did mention that you know triangular sightings go all the way back to the late 1800s, which I had not heard of before I spoke to him. Uh, but they're you know they're real spotty. Now, one of my listeners contacted me you know privately and uh actually i had a skype conversation with her she's in uh australia and 
she told me that her and her mother were in the, were in the garden when she was uh, young, you know, a teenager or so, working in the garden, pulling weeds. And all of a sudden, they felt something and uh, a shadow and looked up. And she said this huge, huge, she said it looked like, you know, if you had to say um, uh, half a mile, something like that, triangle, fly over them. And it, the, she said it was hard to describe, but it was like a pressure that made them both force themselves right down on the ground, like face down, hmm. like a pressure coming down from it. I've never heard anyone else say that before. No, I haven't either. Yeah. Uh, really interesting, though. I think David would be interested in that case. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's a pack ready, documents every triangle case he can come across. Uh, and his book is just loaded with them. Just- now, a few years ago, I, was, uh, I had a condo at, uh, on a golf course, and I had a neighbor that while I was doing my show live— uh, uh, ironically, I was doing my show with someone on drones that huh. evening. Um, she was knocking at my door. I, I, my, had my studio in the basement, so I didn't even hear her, but she told me later, um, she wanted me to come out and see this triangle that was flying over the golf course. She said, I don't know what it was. It didn't make any noise. It was a big, huge triangle with lights and it was, uh, it was just getting dark at the time. I don't, I can't remember what time of year it was. So anyway, I said, really, you got to be kidding me. I was having my show at the same time. I, and I said, I do a show on UFOs. She goes, UFOs? I don't believe in UFOs. So I go, okay. So I, I said, I'll tell you what, would you tell this story on my show next week? And you can remain completely anonymous. And I promise I won't even say, you know, where I, no one knows where I live or anything like that. She goes, absolutely not. She had, <laughs> she had absolutely no interest in being on the show she just wanted to raise me up and get me out so i could see it hmm. you know that was it wow. i thought it was uh pretty funny but yeah. uh, well you know a lot of people uh have reported experiences where they see something and they can't get the attention of other people hmm. uh that's not universally been the case but um it's almost like they can't see it Wow, and I, you know, I don't know what that's about, but uh, I have. We do see things like that, um, including one of my own. Uh, I would. I'm not going to say it a UFO, but something I saw flying uh, low in the sky, and uh, I, I yelled. There were other people in uh, within earshot of me, and I said, "What's that?" And nobody even looked. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, they just. Ignored me, and and uh, I have a pretty loud voice. And <laughs> I said, "What's that?" And I pointed to it, and I ran over to where I could get a better look. And nobody came with me. Nobody looked, and uh, <laughs> and of course, uh, my cell phone was in the in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I I didn't get a chance to get an image of it. But uh, you know, that's the thing. Also, you talk about images, people snapping pictures, whatever. When I had my sighting, it was the last thing from my mind. Um, I didn't have a phone anyway out there at the hot tub. Uh, but regardless, um, I never even, it never even crossed my mind. I was just glued to it. I was fascinated by it. And uh, a picture now, of course, I think I would totally react differently. But at that time, and I think a lot of people are feeling the same way. Like, you know, a picture is like, wow, I never even thought of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I hear that from witnesses sometimes. Or they say, by the time I got my phone out, <laughs> it was yeah. gone. Or they say, yeah, I tried to get a picture, but this is all I got, which is a fuzzy little blob uh, of light, you know, and not very helpful. Uh, well, well I, there was a, I was in Boston uh, in a park oh, a few weeks ago, and there was a blimp flying over, and I thought as a joke I would, you know, send a friend or something, oh, look at the UFO. I couldn't even get my camera ready by the time. And you know how slow blimps go. Yeah. It was just, you know, went through the trees and, you know, above me. And that was, <laughs> I couldn't even get it together. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, I used to live in Southern California where the uh, Goodyear blimp was anchored. And well, one of the Goodyear blimps. And 
see it. You'd see it all the time. But the first time you saw it, you thought it was weird. You know that then you would get used to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, especially at night when you see it for the first time, it it's uh, especially and you can't right. read you can't read the the sign because it's too far away. And then you, but you watch it for a little while and you go, oh, okay, I know what that is. You mean it has like the lit sign on the underside of it? Well, it'll be on the side. It'll be something yeah. you know, like drink Coca Cola or something. And, right. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, but it's if it's far enough away, you can't really make out the letters easily. Mm-hmm. And and then uh, you know, but after a while, you just realize, oh, you know what? I bet that's that blimp. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, I've seen. I've seen that exactly where the light does look really weird too in the bottom of the thing. Yeah, when it's at a distance, your mind tries to make sense of it, you know. Right. Uh, and if it's something that you haven't experienced before, your mind will be racing trying to make some kind of contact with reality and the perception. I think that's a, a really good point you're bringing up here. Um, I, I think it, it's like your your mind. I don't know exactly what they call it, but always tries to make faces out of things. And it's a, it goes back to, you know, evolution and instinct. Well, they say humans have no instinct, but it's actually a survival thing, you know, because of whether it's, uh, you know, you're going to be attacked or whatever it is. So people tend to make things into faces and people tend to make things into things that they know. And when they don't know what they are, um, it really, like when I saw that disc fly over me, that really stunned me. That really like threw everything off. Like I couldn't even move, you know, it's not like I was frozen or anything. It's just the fact that I just, uh, I was totally baffled at what my eyes were seeing. Right. Their mental model of the world has no place for such a thing. And then you, uh, you know, you don't know what to make of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. and that will affect how you perceive it. Um, and Mm -hmm. I think that, we we certainly see you know and also how you remember it because over time your memories may may morph somewhat which is why we always ask a witness yeah. make a sketch write down everything as soon as you can before you talk mm-hmm. to anybody about it mm-hmm. and then report it you know and, and uh people say oh i'm not much of an artist no no just make a sketch <laughs> now this this brings me to a point now uh one of my favorite guests that I've had on the show is uh, was head of the UFO Sweden, uh, Klaus Fon is his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they really take the topic seriously in Sweden. Uh, great guy. And he was telling me the story. Not He's been on the show two times. The first time he was on, him and his wife are coming back from an evening out, I think, for dinner or something. And all of a sudden, they both had this major sighting right in front of them. And he said to her, uh, he's very disciplined in so many ways. And he said to her, don't talk to me (laughs) right now about anything. He says, just go in your room. I'll go in another room and let's uh, write everything down and draw sketches. Oh, good for him. And that's what he did. Yep. That's that's probably one-tenth of one percent of any (laughs) person sighting. Yeah. Uh, not even that much, maybe. Right, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, of the, since you've been doing this for about four years now, uh, you haven't noticed any new ideas, uh, but do you see any glimmer of hope that there may be a breakthrough somehow? Well, there's a couple things going on. Um, so, I will say that I do the new ideas. Uh, I had uh, a MUFON's uh, photo analyst and uh, video analyst. Uh, he's also an astronomer, Mark D'Antonio, really sharp guy, nice guy. I saw him this weekend. We almost lost him, actually. He had, uh, he had some heart trouble, but he's, mm. uh, he's a young guy, too. Anyway, himself and uh, special effects, movie special effects um Trumbull. designer Trumbull. Yeah, Doug Trumbull. Yeah, I know I I've uh yeah, I know what you're talking about. Go ahead. Okay, so if you have you had either one of these people on your show? Uh no, but we have spoken to Mark uh on Skype about some other mis- other matters. Uh All right. Well, I just didn't want to repeat anything. Um so okay, they have a 
they have these sensor units. Well, also, I just got an email from Leslie Kane recently, and uh, she's going to be on the show before uh, Shermer coming up this week. Also with Mark Ronio are putting together these little sensor units that will be, you know, basically wireless and have all different types of uh, equipment in them that will be put in, you know, hot UFO hotspots to collect data. And it's, uh, it's an interesting concept. And, and hopefully it's going to at least get the scientific community interested. Now, the reason science is not really has not really been interested in this topic in my beliefs and listening to other people talk about it is that it's not an easily solvable problem. Scientists want to take on something that can be solved, you know, rather quickly um, that they can actually get funded for. Um, the UFO topic is something that is evasive and, you know, as far as evidence goes, it's a, uh, it's kind of like uh, trying to gather information on, you know, a meteor or something. It yeah. might happen tonight. It might not happen tonight. It's, it's really hard to compare it to anything else out there. Right. Well, it, the evidence never repeats itself. Uh, right. And so, but I think that, well, I, I've, I won't uh, say it here, but I, on my unidentified science, I tried to talk about uh, you know, some of the things I think reasons scientists won't come near the topic, uh, why, why it would be a career-limiting move for them to do so. Uh, and it's really not entirely their fault, but, but uh, mm -hmm. some, some of it's historical, and some of it is, mm -hmm. is toxicity in the, in the field. But... Uh, Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, the the way to get scientific credibility back is to try to, I mean, you're not going to get repeat observations very often. And if you do, that probably means it's a natural phenomenon. Uh, well, that's what you would, that could be an assumption, um, yeah. you know, but there's so many um, people that talk about these, you know, repeat sightings, like the Belgian, you mentioned earlier, the Belgian Triangle. You know, that was in an area, the thing that, you know, doesn't make any sense. And oftentimes I just wonder that we may be completely wrong just in our wondering what a UFO is. Is that um, why would, if something did travel, say, you know, 100 light years or five light years or whatever to get here, uh, why would it stick around in one little area? Because um, a lot of times people will see the same UFO um, for days on end and sometimes even longer, you know, repeatedly. So things don't seem to make any sense like that. But, uh, you know, the whole thing is just totally baffling anyway. Well, it might be for our benefit. Uh, but, of course, we don't really... Trying to figure out the, what would motivate a very advanced technical civilization is probably hopeless. Yeah, uh, right. Mm -hmm. and, or why they would do anything. Uh and you know, just like trying to make faces out of things, we're trying to um, we're trying to use uh, what we would do, uh, you know, and yeah. what you know. We always compare our thoughts or our our, our reactions or even our evolution to what um, they may be. Yeah, and we really don't have anything else to work with, right? I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. so you, basically, you have to be wrong, and. Uh, then you compare your wrong idea to observations and and try to fix it. Uh, you're, mm -hmm. you're not you're not going to be able to form a, a really good hypothesis about anything, which is what's called normal science, right? Uh, that that's not available on on this mm -hmm. in this field. We're kind of where the Renaissance scientists were. We're trying to figure out what lightning was, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's still. There's still a lot of things that are really hard for even no matter how much, uh, you know, they're looked into, you know, quantum mechanics, uh, entanglement. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, dark matter, dark energy. These are all things that are, you know, not really 100 percent in any type of way, but, you know, just uh, observed and, you know, that um, hardly makes sense. Right. Of course, we wouldn't even know about those things if we hadn't undertaken rigorous science uh mm -hmm. you know dark 
dark energy is not something that we found out through divine revelation. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was something that came uh, from a lot of very careful astronomical observations. Uh, right. So, and yeah, we don't know what it is, but uh, I think it's cool. There's stuff we still don't have to figure it out. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, and when we figure that out, it's probably something else that, that we won't understand. So that, that's well, I think um, I always think of it this way is, you know, it's just the more you look into things, the more, you know, you see that there's more questions. Right. Yeah. And, and that's why I always say, you know, better questions, what we're all about. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, answers are kind of boring. Uh, It's questions that are are fun and exciting. As soon as you get the answer, you say, okay, well, I guess we're done there. Right. It becomes stamp collecting. Uh, right. So, uh, now, uh, you've, you've finished four years of this, uh, podcast UFO and you, when you look out to the future, uh, I know you've you've cha- you've gone to uh, asking people for contributions and they get bonus content. But uh, mm-hmm. how do you see sort of the future of podcast UFO? Where where does it go? Well, I I hope that um, I, I really enjoy doing the show. It's a lot of fun, and you know sometimes I think I'm going to run out of people to talk to, and then. Uh, all of a sudden I have this, you know, all of a sudden I have like all these people lined up, interesting people that I had never, not even thought of. I don't think, you know, I mean, I, I really don't want a lot of repeat guests, but I think that, um, there are, you know, there's a lot of, uh, cultivating to do out there as far as, uh, people, it doesn't always have to be people that are like I say, that are on the circuit or anything like that. It's just someone that has a real interesting story or, or interesting thoughts. And, um, you know, a lot of people are authors of books that are coming out, stuff like that, but they don't always have to be. You know, it could be um, sometimes just speaking to someone, someone will send me an email and sound interesting enough. I've had a, some shows that they're just I called it listener sightings, uh, things like that. So I think the show is going to continue as long as, I can do it. I really enjoy it a lot. I don't, uh, the reason for the contributions is actually, um, my bandwidth uh, was getting used up enough that where I had to get a dedicated server and, you know, it cost the show basically was costing me money and I was just hoping to break even. And there's, uh, some real dedicated listeners that have really helped me out. And, um, you know, I'm actually currently, I, um, uh, I helped with a recently with a startup company, in, uh, and they ended up uh, kind of a little bit, I should, don't know if I should say this on the air, but running out of money. Mm. <laughs> so they cut back. So currently I have some time now to really wow. focus on doing this, and it's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah, well, um, the, the format of the show right you have right now is... is it's usually you and Alejandro Rojas at the beginning, and then you roll in into an interview from there. Right. Uh, so have, you've, it seems like you've formed a bit of an alliance with Open Minds. Yes. I'm on their show every Monday uh, for news. Uh, first, he, uh, Alejandro was on my show. And then um, I think it was about two or three months ago, uh, Jason and uh, I think it's Megan both left um, Open Minds. So I've been doing filling in for the news there and having a good time. I really agree with a lot of uh, what Alejandro Rojas, uh, you know, his uh, he's very uh, very cautious mm-hmm. person, rather skeptical, and really looks at what's going on. And I enjoy uh, our uh, I enjoy our news together. Yeah, he Either does. My he, show he does, he does more debunking than some than a lot of the professional skeptics. <laughs> yes, and um, you know I have. Uh, we were talking about this today. We, we, you know, there's there's some trolls out there. I, I get them, he gets them, and you know, I have uh, someone that has. Uh, this is actually a ufologist that has been following me around and telling me to to get rid of Alejandro, and there's no <laughs> way that I'm going to do that. And you know, saying that you know he's uh, more or less calling him like a disinformation person and 
you know, he does things just for money and all that. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, it's a ufologist that is doing this, which really is uh, baffling. Yeah, you'll run into a lot of crazy in the field. That's for sure. I think uh, it was you that said uh, the swamp needs to be drained in yeah. the UFO field. Uh, you know, and that's, that kind of makes me think of this, uh, you know, after dealing with this guy. You know, some of the people, they wouldn't hurt if they uh, did something else. Yeah, well, we've been, you know, advocating for sort of creating a, some distance between traditional ufology and and the, the study of of unidentified aerial phenomena uh, because, you know, the, the, it's there, the, the field is toxic. There've been a lot of, a lot of, uh, very uh, difficult people involved who are stuck on very dogmatic ideas and, Mm -hmm. uh, are committed to the reality of certain cases regardless And they cannot back down, and uh, they cannot proceed scientifically. Uh, it's a, it's you know, I mean, one one uh, misconception that is out there is that people in the UFO f- field make a lot of money. Well, they really don't. But some people do get, um, you know, they get uh, recognition. You know, um, maybe get on a couple of TV shows, stuff like that. But you're absolutely right. If um, they don't, if something changes, some new evidence comes forward. Like I believe right now, I want to say Kecksburg, um, the Kecksburg sighting. Um, I have to look into this, and I'm just talking off the cuff. But I believe they've finally figured out what that was, and it was a some type of military capsule or something, or experimental. Uh, but there are people that you know make their you know, their whole world about Kecksburg. Mm-hmm. And it'll be interesting. Um, we can also talk, if you'd like to, a little bit about what happened back in, you know, last May down oh. in Mex- Mexico City. Yeah, I think that probably most listeners are familiar with the broad outline of that. But, yeah. Uh, it, do you think that that there are people who are so desperate to get some real evidence for Roswell that they just fell for a hoax or what ha- what happened there i really can't understand that whole situation i've tried to understand it uh because there wasn't even two seconds that went by when i saw the image like immediately i said my god that's a mummy and that's a that's a you know a museum you know what instantly instantly and i can't imagine these are these are very bright people uh Jaime Mosin and uh, Don Schmidt, Tom Carey. These are really bright people. Now, I understand that there was uh, someone else involved and they couldn't quite see the the best image and all that. Um, But the thing that is uh, really troublesome at this point is that there are people that will not back down that... Will are standing the ground saying, even though all the evidence came forward, they were able to take the placard and deblur it. Right. Uh, anybody could do it. You could do it. Anyone can in just a few minutes. And it definitely says, you know, the mummy of a boy uh, found at uh, Verde Mesa. Uh, it's all right there. Um, this was a mummy that was dug up in the late 1800s and then reburied. Um, you know, later, I, I don't know, maybe in the 40s or 50s or something like that. But uh, the bottom line is, is that there's three people, as far as I know, and maybe even more that are totally standing their ground, even though there's total evidence against, you know, this being an alien. And I think it's, I, I can't understand it. I understand the fact that there was a lot of money invested in a film a lot of money invested in the conference and gained at that conference. If you do the math, uh, a lot of people were there. Uh, there was some, you know, six figures made uh, money that I suppose if um, there was a total uh, disclosure of, well, okay, this was not a hoax, but you know, we made a big mistake. 
then they would be liable to give all the money back. And I think maybe that's what it is that's keeping them um, standing their ground. Maybe it's a money issue. I don't know. Well, it, it's become a credibility issue, I think, for some people. Uh, oh, I, but yeah, 100%. And uh, especially those who were particularly mean and aggressive against the people that were investigating the placard and, and finding that it was what it said, mm-hmm. uh, accusing them of, of lying or hoaxing or making it up or whatever. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it it's clearly... The, the Roswell mummy uh, may stand, I think, for a long time as a kind of a, an icon of of how you follow just get things wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really grateful for the one fact that this whole event didn't happen in the States and that it wasn't covered by mainstream media. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, first of all, if there's going to be a serious unveiling, okay, we're showing the world an alien, wouldn't you think that there would be huge media coverage? I would think so. But, uh, you know, we just, as a group, fell on our face once again, really. Yeah, well, I mean, the press has seen a lot of uh, a lot of Bigfoots, you know, and other things come <laughs> and go. Uh, yeah, we have the body of Bigfoot. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> we don't right. actually have the body. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, in the uh, who's that guy that had the Bigfoot in his freezer or something? Yeah, uh, yeah. turned out to be like a, a costume of some or something. Like yeah, that. that's right. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I mean that that's been such a circus that mm-hmm. nobody, even even the media who love sensational stories that they can get a whole handle on, uh, won't report on that. It's just you know, yep. Well, it's kind of like the crying wolf thing too. You know, I mean, yeah. there's so many times. You can do this, and you know. Um, again, I said I don't. I don't know if uh, in my lifetime anything will be revealed or not. But uh, even if it's revealed, even if there was pure evidence, there's going to be people that aren't going to believe it. You know, that's just the way things are. Right, and, and well, I mean, it's usually it might take a generation or so uh, before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm. I know that. You know. When Darwin came out with his theory, uh, most of the intellectuals accepted it pretty quickly, but the public did not accept it for a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. And now it's kind of mainstream, except here in the United States. But you know, everywhere in Europe, they'll say, "Oh, yeah, you know, evolution—that's how life came to be." Mm-hmm. Uh, in right. the United States, there's something like uh, it's almost fifty-fifty split. Amazing. Uh, and there's, well, I mean, that if you believe the poll numbers, I, which I, I guess I do. Uh, yeah. So it, there, it take, can take time for people, especially if it, if it disrupts their worldview. Mm-hmm. To accept now, or in the case of uh, their religious beliefs. Yeah, I think a lot of religious people could accommodate uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, that that debate's been going on for a long time. The Catholics have pretty much come out and said, "Yeah, that's okay mm-hmm. with us." Uh, I'm not as sure. long as we can bless them or whatever it is, baptize them. That's what. It is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that would go away pretty fast. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they that's right on the top of the list. Mm. And uh, but you know there are fundamentalists who are never going to that would never accept it. But I think they're in the minority in most, at least in most developed societies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. Well, I, I hope hope they are. Uh, <laughs> right. But the, uh, yeah, I mean, but now the scientists, you know, scientists often are very conservative and won't change their view on things uh, until sort of the next generation comes along and says, well, you know, this new evidence looks pretty good to us. But, uh, you know, we're seeing the same thing in astrobiology, which is there's no evidence yet for life outside the Earth. But there's a whole generation of young scientists who call themselves astrobiologists who are very enthusiastic and are doing all kinds of good work, uh, even though they haven't got a living thing on Mars or a living thing on Enceladus yet. They're, they're laying the groundwork for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and they, have, they, they are actually a lot more respectable. than it, and when, when it started out, when Carl Sagan wanted to start 
a new science called exobiology, <laughs> it really was not considered real science or real respectable. And hmm. now th this new generation of scientists, it it's considered completely normal to want to be an astrobiologist. So now if you ask an astrobiologist about UFOs, they'll probably just laugh in your face. But uh, yeah. Uh, well, earlier you were speaking about that Ray Stanford thinks he saw something on Mars that, you know, could be a, uh, uh, you know, some type of fossil or something like yeah, that. Yeah, some kind of fossil trace. Uh, I really think uh, in my personal thoughts, it's only an opinion, but my personal views or thoughts is that most likely there was probably life on Mars of some type. There was water there. The water is long gone. The magnetosphere is all but gone, I believe. Yes. Um, you know, so the water went away, the atmosphere went away, but there is so much evidence that there was water and there is water there uh, running, uh, you know, ch changing water with the seasons and all that. Well, it's more like uh, spurting water. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is a little bit of water on Mars, but it, it, it looks a lot like a dead world now. Uh, oh, yeah. But, oh, I'm not saying, I don't believe, I would not believe that, I mean, I'd be very shocked if there was actually life there now. But I'm thinking, you know, I mean, it's, you know, a billion years ago, very well could have yeah. life. Well, life very might well have actually been there first. You know, there was just an announcement today. I don't know how well it's going to hold up, but uh, some scientists at UCLA found evidence for life on Earth uh, more than four billion years ago, which is right, you know, right around the time the planet formed. Was wow. forming, uh, which is crazy. It doesn't really make sense. It it it's almost as if it arrived uh, from somewhere else. Panspermia. Yeah. Well, it could have arrived from Mars or Venus. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, there might have been a pretty active change exchange of biology in those days because a lot of a lot of things were smacking into the different planets. It pretty Wasn't hard. there a lot of volcanism between? Four billion years and now? Oh, yes, there was, there were, uh, and there was, uh, and on Mars as well, uh, had a lot mm. of volcanoes. Uh, Venus is, of course, it, in its early days may have been habitable as well. It's not anymore, but it, w it was at some point. So the various living things that have got smacked into and, and kicked around the inner solar system may have been traded between the planets, and Mars may have had the first habitable environment and may have very well uh, been the, the cradle of life. It really could. Now, it's really hard to, for the human brain to understand time when it comes to these big numbers. You know, I mean, yeah. right now we, we can go back to so many million years here and all that, but we really don't know, you know, the Earth is, you know, four billion years or so old, or, um, and we really don't know exactly what happened you know, a billion years ago. You know, I, I know these are, these numbers don't make any sense to no. anybody because for the human mind to understand, I, I saw a demonstration by, we talked earlier about Mark D'Antonio. He took a, this is really funny. He took a roll of toilet paper. He taped uh, both sides of it so it was sturdy. And then he had someone help him in the audience and he took and he walked around the audience and he'd get to this certain point of the role and he'd say, well, this is when the first known life was on the planet earth. And then he'd roll it out more. And, you know, this is, uh, he'd get almost near the end and this is the dinosaurs. This is 4 billion years, this roll of toilet paper. And then he gets to the very end, the last half an inch or something like that. And that's human existence, mm -hmm. you know? So it's really hard to wrap your mind around these numbers when it comes to time and the billions of years and all that. Uh, there was a point I was getting at when I started this, and it has to do, um, you know, with with life um, evolving on, on different planets in just our solar system. It's awful hard to say with all this time that's gone by and all the changes that have gone, happened. You know? Right. It, it's, uh, yeah, well, uh, now with this new evidence that there's been life for four point, I guess the number they came up with was 4.1 billion years uh, that's, I mean, yeah, you're right. It, you say the, you can say the number, you can do the arithmetic with it. You can do abstract calculations, but yeah, 
you have no idea what four point four billion years is. It doesn't it doesn't compute in the human mind how That's right. how much time that is. It's a lot a lot of time. And we we think a thousand years is a long time, and it's really not. Uh, we think a million years is a long time, and it's really not. Uh, right. Exactly. It's just, and you know, our the pyramids will be gone. Will be totally. There will be absolutely no trace of the pyramids in thirty million years. And I know that sounds funny, and it's all that thirty million years is so, you know, so much time ahead. Why are you even bringing that up? Well, um, in thirty million years, the pyramids will be completely gone. That's not really that much time when it no. comes when you're when you're standing next to four billion years. Yeah, it's quite a bit longer than humans have been on Earth, but uh, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah the late the latest numbers I think are coming out around maybe 150 thousand years that of our species. Uh, I mean, uh, which is a blink of the eye. Yeah, and most of that was spent living in caves. You know, and I I don't know. Um, I'm going to really sound conspiratorial by saying this, but I don't know if I really believe that we've only been around for 150,000 years. It sure does not seem like that much time. No, it isn't. To uh, be the what we are. Well, we had precursor species that were right that yeah. looked quite a bit like us, but uh, didn't have. And quite... I think they go back to yeah. you know four four million years or something like that. Uh, well, we split for the chimpanzees. The latest evidence split for the chimpanzees about four or five million years ago. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. So, you know, hey, you know, great, 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 et cetera, grandpa w- w- looked a lot like uh, cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's a Tarzan reference, if anyone doesn't know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess the kids today don't know Tarzan, but yeah. Uh, yeah. That was my favorite show when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I like that one. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the uh, so anyway, Martin, it's getting late for me. Uh, I'm going to wrap up soon. I just wanted to give you a chance to you know put in any final plugs in for your show or anything else you're up to right now. Well, um, the show is uh, basically like I say, I really enjoy doing the show, and I never know who's going to be on next. Um, you were one of the good guests. I've really enjoyed talking to you as uh, as tonight as well thank you so it's um live every wednesday night anyone can listen to the whole show two hours long free and that's on the dark matter digital network um you can also get to it from my website which is podcastufo.com there's a chat box where people can participate in the chat box and also there's a call-in number for call-ins and there's uh, several thousand people listen live but most of the people um, we'll be listening, you know, through a podcast. Hmm. Well, that's a, uh, and so it, your URL is podcastufo.net, is it? Or dot, dot com. Dot com. Podcastufo.com. Yep. I'll put a link in, in whatever show notes that this, uh, this interview gets attached to. Uh, Great. And I'm a regular listener. I especially enjoy uh, Martin and uh, Alejandro's repartee at the beginning of the show. Uh, and thank you. Alejandro, does a uh, uh, often will debunk whatever the latest uh, <laughs> rumor yeah. is that's floating around, uh, which is very useful. I, I've pointed people to that many times. Said, "Well, you should go listen to what Alejandro had to say about that. <laughs> it wasn't as good as you think." And <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, well, yeah. Thank- I'm glad he catches things because, yeah. um, you know, there was a rumor recently. I don't know. Um, I know we're wrapping this up. There was a rumor recently about George Bush Senior. Ah, yes. Yeah, saying that, uh, you know, we couldn't, the Americans couldn't handle the truth about UFOs. And that was just, that was just a hoax. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea, you know, uh, actually asked him to talk about it. So he looks into those things, and I'm glad he does when I don't always have time to do it. So if you guys want the straight dope on the UFOs, tune in to Martin Show every, every Wednesday night, right? Every Wednesday night? Yes. What time, what time is it? It's about 9 Eastern? It is 8 to 10 Eastern time. 8 to 10 Eastern. Okay. Which for international listeners, that would be right now uh, 0 to 2 GM. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Martin. And uh, I thank you for having me on your show about, well, I guess it was about a year ago, wasn't it? Uh, That's right. And yeah. uh, we will uh, talk again soon, I'm sure. 
All right. Very, very good, right. Paul. Thanks right. so Thanks. much. Okay. Thanks. This has been API Conversation number one with Martin Willis. For more information, please go to apicasefiles.com. For more information about Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Group, go to aerial-phenomenon.org, where you, if you want to report a UFO, there is a button there on the homepage. Click Report a UFO. We'll see you next time on API Conversations.